dominated the headlines last year from the war on terror, from economic turmoil to political instability. We'll explore the biggest news stories from 2016 and look to the year ahead. Hello everyone, I'm Asiye Namdar in for Anna Naidu and you're watching The Heat. of terror dominated 2016 headlines across Europe and other parts of the world, a raging civil war in Syria, millions displaced, and now an uneasy, shaky ceasefire to say the least. The United States elected a new president, billionaire businessman Donald Trump, and China continued its rise in economic might and influence. Those stories and many more are the legacy of 2016, so what impact did it all have? And what's next? Joining me now, Simon Marks, president and chief correspondent of Feature Story News. Wang Guan is a political correspondent here at CGTN. And my friend and colleague, Afshin Molavi, is the editor of the New Silk Road Monitor. Gentlemen, welcome. Let's begin with terrorism around the world. 2016 was not a good year, not just in Europe, in all parts of the world. We're talking about Iraq, Bangladesh, Syria, Afghanistan, Yemen, Nigeria, Pakistan, Brussels, just to name a few, 17 attacks in Turkey. Turkey ended the year the way it started. Is this the new normal? Simon, let me begin with you. Well, you know, I mean, I think you're absolutely right, uh, Asiya, to, to seize there on what happened uh, in Turkey on New Year's Eve, because it wound up what had been a dreadful year 2016, and it started 2017 in a way that many people obviously fear will continue to be part of the new normal. And I think the real concern uh, as we head into 2017, uh, epitomized by that awful attack on that nightclub in Istanbul, is that while there have undoubtedly been uh, huge progress, uh, m m uh, there has been progress in terms of battling uh, Islamic State uh, on the battlefield uh, in Iraq and in Syria, there is still this enormous danger that very easily this group, through proxies in places like Turkey, can unleash this kind of terror. And however you look at it, it's going to be enormously difficult to prevent incidents like that from happening in Turkey again and again and again, and uh, also in other parts of the world, including, of course, mainland Europe. Afshin, does the international community have a handle on this problem, especially when we talk about ISIL, a lot of these attacks were either claimed by ISIL or inspired by ISIL. Yeah, absolutely, Asiya. And you know, what, what, when we think about al-Qaeda, right, al-Qaeda at its peak had maybe about 2,000 or so, you know, men at its disposal. ISIS has tens of thousands at their disposal. You know, al-Qaeda, someone once said, was the Harvard of terrorist groups because it was hard to get into them. ISIS, you know, anyone can get into it, right? So, so what we have, in, in you ask in terms, do, they have, do we have a handle on this? No, we don't. We are going to see See more attacks of the sort that we saw in Turkey, of the sort that we saw in Europe. And the reason we're going to see more attacks is because some of these are just simply indefensible. When somebody goes into a crowd with a machine gun, that's, that's almost an indefensible attack. And what we're going to be you know, seeing is more police and intelligence activity around this. But, have, but having said that, you know, where we're going in 2017, I'm afraid this is the new normal. And let's not, let's know, it, this has been happening across Europe. Uh, there are currently, according to the FBI director, investigations in every single state here in the United States about ISIS, unnetworked and some networked uh, cells uh, that could potentially hit the United States in 2017. Wang how much do you think the war in Syria has made a bad situation even worse? I think it has, uh, to some extent, a lot. And unfortunately, what we saw in Syria is it has really become a battleground for great power politics. You know, it, it's really an information warfare. If you read New York Times or Democracy Now!, you hear one side of the story whereby the Syrian government of Assad and the Russians are bombing civilians. We saw the images of those hospitalized children. But if you read from the Chinese sources, or perhaps Russians or or Persian uh, or Arabic, for that matter, uh, you will see a, a very different storyline whereby you know uh, it's really the, the Chinese and the, the, you know, the Russians and the Assad regime are freeing the people from the terrorists. So really, we saw, unfortunately, Syria is quickly descending into a battleground for 
uh, a proxy war, for great power politics. But I think in 2017, what we should do is really to turn to turn our attention to the fabrics of Western European societies, you know, the alienation, uh, the difficulty for the Muslim population to integrate into London, into Paris, into France, into those Western European societies. And we're going to go ahead. And, go and ahead. that, of course, is exactly why Turkey now is such uh, so much at the crossroads of all of this. I spent a lot of time in 2016 in Istanbul. And, uh, you know, first of all, you've got the geography of the place, the crossroads between Europe and Asia. And so and there's West. the symbolism of that. But secondly, also the fact that it's that cosmopolitan existence that's under threat. It was that that was targeted in that nightclub uh, on New Year's Eve in, in uh, Istanbul. Uh, and it's the very... Uh, continuance uh, of that kind of lifestyle in Istanbul and in other places that becomes under threat. And Simon, sorry, Turkey had quite a rough year. I mean, let's yeah, not forget, it, besides ISIS, the Kurdish insurgency uh, and the battle against the, the Kurdish militants, and let's not forget the coup, the counter coup, the, 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 the reaction, uh, the, the rolling up of civil liberties across Turkey uh, as, as Erdogan takes on more and more power. So certainly they would rank as, as, as the, the country that might have had the Anus Herabilis of, yeah. you know, 2016. I, let me pick up on something that Wang Wan said. Russia and Turkey, suddenly the brokers of peace in Syria. Now, granted, a fragile peace and its status is a little bit up in the air as we speak. Uh, but do they offer the best chance for peace, something the United States could not do? But that's the key, isn't it? I mean, the whole point about Russia's involvement in Syria was partly to shore up the government of Bashar al-Assad, no question about that. And Bashar al-Assad must be, you know, thinking that he's been almost reborn in January 2017. I mean, the idea that he can now think in terms of continuing to remain in government for a while is astonishing, where things were just 12 and 18 months ago. But what Vladimir Putin has most successfully done uh, in Syria is demonstrate to the world that he's able to run circles around an American government led by Barack Obama as it ha has been and really raise the specter of whether the United States can continue arguing that it is the indispensable nation on the world stage. And that was really one of the drivers behind Putin's whole uh, determination to get involved in the Syrian conflict and uh, help Bashar al-Assad out. OK, let me move on to one other thing and I'm going to bring Wang Guan and Afshin in here. Let's talk about Brexit. Donald Trump's stunning election victory, and of course the rise of populism. Um, and then I want to talk about China's relationship with the United States, Wang Guan. But let's talk about the impact of Brexit. And we have some sound from people in the United Kingdom who gave their reaction after the vote. Let's take a listen. Shocked and uh, ashamed to be British today. Can't believe it. I'm really disappointed. Disappointed in the country. I think it's a better future for them uh, to be able to decide things, you know, to do what they want instead of being ruled by the EU, telling them they can't do this and, and that. It's people who isn't going to affect them. Um, it's going to take a while for it to come into effect. Um, have spoken for us. Um, they've spoken for us on a bunch of lies um, and empty promises. It means the British people will decide what our government's going to do. We've not had that since 1973. It's a remarkable change to this country. It brings confidence back in what we can achieve as a nation. And it means being back on the global stage as Britain, not as part of the failing EU. Failing EU. Afshin Molavi, let me turn to you. Sure. What, what, why were we so stunned by this vote, first of all? And is EU a failing entity? Right. You know, it's a, it's a good question. Why were we so stunned? Because, you know, in, in so many ways, this was a, um, a repudiation of the British political elite. It was a repudiation of the mainstream British media as well. And it was a big slap in the face against globalization, a big slap in the face against the EU. Now, is the, you know, can we call the EU a failure? Um, I, I wouldn't go that far. I would say that the EU is certainly weighed down um, uh, the, the UK on the immigration issue. But I think if, if we were able to peel off the migration issue, because a lot of these things are tied together. Uh, you know, there was fear of, of uh, mass migration in the UK. Because if you were, you know, someone sitting in Manchester, globalization to you and the EU to you, what does that mean? It means it means loss of jobs, it means mass migration, and it means deindustrialization. That's not a really a, a formula for success. Uh, you know, having said that, if you lived in the metropolitan areas, the big cities of, in the UK, um, 
the uh, globalization has been good to you. So uh, it, it's hard to, it's where you stand on whether the EU has been a failure depends on where you sit. Um, Simon, a sudden resignation. Talk to us about that. Yes, and you how, mean yes. yes. And how significant is it? Well, it is significant. This is the British ambassador uh, to the European Union, the British ambassador to Brussels, who suddenly uh, quit. Uh, there is a discussion back in the UK about whether he went of his own accord or whether he was pushed. Uh, but certainly he was one of the more vocal uh, and articulate voices uh, about uh, Britain's relationship with the European Union. Uh, and on the face of it, was going to be a fairly central player in developing the plan uh, that is now foisted on the government, uh, led by uh, Theresa May, who of course did not uh, believe in leaving the European Union, but now finds herself uh, leading a government that is committed to Brexit, uh, he was going to be involved in all of those negotiations. Now, she says 2060, 2017 uh, is going to be the year in which she triggers Article 50 uh, of the Rome Treaty, which is the process that then begins a two-year period of negotiation for ultimate British withdrawal. Is that going to happen this year? Will the courts make moves to try and delay it? There's this big case up before the uh, Supreme Court uh, in the United Kingdom. I mean, I think it's still all uh, very, very uncertain. And whether those British people that you heard from on that video clip ultimately get satisfied with the outcome of all of this, still very much in doubt. Wang Guan, uh, Donald Trump's election victory, it's safe to say, took a lot of people by surprise, just like the Brexit vote. A lot of questions about the future relationship between Beijing and Washington. And really, uh, Donald Trump's style of communication and his rather, what's the word I want to use, fascination with social media and Twitter and the way he chooses to send his message out. Let's talk about a couple of tweets um, in regards to foreign policy. The first one is about Russia. He tweeted, great move on delay by Vladimir Putin. I always knew he was very smart. He was referring to Putin's decision not to expel American diplomats in response to U.S. sanctions against Russia. Then he tweets, this is just a sample, people. There is a, there is a <laughs> lot of tweets. We can't cover them all. He tweets, China has been taking out massive amounts of money and wealth from the United States in totally one-sided trade, but will not help with North Korea. Nice. And we've got reaction from China's foreign ministry. Let's take a listen. Efforts made by the Chinese side are obvious for all to see. We hope that the relevant parties will refrain from words and deeds that will lead to the escalation of tension. Wang Guan? Right. Uh, here, was our, here was our former press attaché here in the U.S. Embassy and now the spokesperson for the foreign ministry. Uh, and of course, this was the soundbite that we heard from was from a press conference yesterday and out of the some 15 questions yesterday, end of the uh, beginning of the year press conference, six were concerning Donald Trump. So you do see the popularity is so mutual. So is China concerned um, about the future relationship with the United States under a Trump administration? You know what? I think here, living, having lived in Washington for a while, it is very unique here. That is, that has a 24/7 news cycle. You know, the White House has a symbiotic relationship with the press corps. But in, you know, in China, it doesn't work like that. Um, policy oh, makers... Juan, surely there must be some concern here. Okay, the thing is, let, let, me, let, me, let me explain. <laughs> okay. The thing is, I think in China, people are more concerned with the trend lines than the headlines. What I mean is, I've talked to a lot of academia, the policymakers, and uh, members of the press. They're really more concerned about um, how he go about doing his business uh, after January the 20th. And... Uh, what are the bargaining chips uh, from the Chinese side to prevent Trump from doing what he said he would do, like the Taiwan on the question of Taiwan on trade? So, I think Beijing is not that concerned. Of course, they're concerned, but not that concerned. We're more about thinking of our own bargaining chips and uh, how to, you know, if he wants to make deal, let's make deal. Let me ask you a quick question from all three of you before we go to break. Can Donald Trump abandon the One China policy? Yes or no? He can. But will he? I, I think it's, you know, the, the foreign policy pressure from the elites in Washington, D.C. on him not to go that route will be intense. How he reacts to foreign policy pressure from elites in Washington, D.C., how can, how can one predict? Wang Guan. I don't think he will, given the domestic as well as international and Chinese pressure. 
I've seen. N no, one hopes as a businessman he can read a balance sheet. China had a record-breaking year of investment in the United States, $45 billion plus this past year. Uh, and, uh, you know, one would hope as a businessman he can read the balance sheet and there would be uh, a danger to the U.S. economy if he were to do that.